Hi, my name is Helen, and I'm at the Eisenhower Presidential Library and Museum here in Abilene, Kansas. Today, we are honoring those who suffered and died, as well as those who did even the smallest thing they could to help others during the Holocaust. When speaking of the Holocaust, we are looking at the time period from 1933 to 1945. Humanity, or the act of being humane, means to show compassion and sympathy towards others. Add that little I-N prefix at the beginning, and the meaning is turned on its head. Inhumanity, or inhumane, means extremely cruel and brutal behavior. The Holocaust included both. And we're going to talk about examples of both today. But we have capitalized the word humanity in our title because that is what we really want to focus on. The ways in which people showed humanity when they were caught up in the most inhumane of situations. The Holocaust is also called the Shoah. It's a Hebrew word meaning destruction. It was the systematic, bureaucratic, state-sponsored persecution and murder of approximately 6 million Jews by the Nazi regime and its collaborators. But what does that mean? Let's break it down. The Shoah was an organized, official, government-supported ill-treatment and murder of approximately 6 million Jews by the Nazi regime and their partners. The Nazis who came to power in Germany in January 1933 believed that Germans were racially superior and that the Jews deemed inferior were an alien threat to the so-called German racial community. Now, propaganda has been used throughout history to persuade people into thinking a certain way. The two depictions of the men projected in front of you is an example of one of the many ways propaganda was used during the time of the Holocaust. Let's take a look at both of these portrayals of men. I want you to compare them. Now, here's a time if your teacher wants to pause or you're thinking of your answers in your head, that's fine. So let's first start with the tall man. What are some adjectives or some descriptive words that describe him? Hmm. Well, sure. Like I said before, he's tall. He looks strong and able. He's working physical labor outside, again, a, a symbol of, of strength. He has that fair skin, blonde hair, and I bet he has blue eyes. Hmm. Now, this man is what the Nazis felt referred to as the Aryan race. This is what they believed the Aryan race looked like, which meant non-Jewish, white Western European, typically blonde and blue-eyed and tall. The idea behind the Aryan race was based on the mythical ancestors of the German people. Hmm, mythical, interesting. Now let's look at the other man, what are some adjectives that might describe this man? Short, plump. Now his job is, is definitely different than the man that we just compared or that we just looked at. He's in a suit, so he must work behind a desk. Mm -hmm. Sort of rough around the edges, smoking, elongated, large nose. So lots of stereotypical symbols um, are being represented in this man. Now, it's important to know that Jews were not the only target during the Holocaust. Nazis also deemed other groups inferior because of their religious or political beliefs or because of a different behavior or physical traits. Among them were the gypsies, disabled persons, communists, socialists, Jehovah Witnesses, homosexuals, and people of color. Let's take a moment to really look at this photo. What do you see? Hmm. Now, what did all these inferiors have in common? 
they did not fit the Nazis' ideal of the Aryan race. Think back to the depiction of the German Aryan man. He was tall and strong, healthy, and a white European. This group of people don't compare. Adolf Hitler became Chancellor of Germany in 1933 and wrongly blamed the Jews for Germany's defeat in World War I, as well as the economic crisis that followed. Hitler was convinced that getting rid of the Jews would help make Germany powerful again. There were no facts to support his claim. Hitler's ideals of an Aryan race ran quickly through Germany. In May 1933, groups of college students throughout Germany led a series of book burnings. The books that were burned were considered to have un-German spirit. What we are about to watch is the original footage of a book burning. Not long after becoming chancellor, Germany's president died. With the backing of the German military, Hitler became the new president of Germany, as well as having the office of chancellor. Once president, Hitler terminated the office of president, and in 1934, he announced he would be the Führer, meaning the supreme leader of Germany. With Hitler making the claim as Führer, there would be no limitations to Hitler's power and authority. In 1934, Germany became a dictatorship. By 1935, Hitler began passing laws against the Jews, expelling them from being doctors and lawyers, banning them from theaters, sports, cafes, and parks. Anti-Jewish propaganda promoted the idea of a superior Aryan master race of tall, blonde, and blue-eyed Germans. As Hitler's Nazi army conquered countries, they began requiring everyone to register for a kin card or an identification card. That's what you see on the left of your screen. In 1935, the Nuremberg race laws stripped Jews of their citizenship and prohibited them from marrying non-Jews. By 1938, Jews had to have the letter J stamped on their identification cards, and the Jewish children were banned from state schools. A turning point for Jews came on the night of November 9th, 1938, which became known as Crystal Knock, or Night of Broken Glass. We're going to listen to a firsthand account of a Holocaust survivor, Margaret Friedelander, as she recalls Crystal Knock. I saw uniform people at a store where the glass was broken. We see our neighbors grabbing the things from the store. The uniform people stood in the door and watching it and laughing and having a good time. I'm Margaret Friedland. I was born in Berlin on the 5th of November, 1921. I was on my way to work in the morning. And when I came down, I felt that it, the air is not the same as usual. The synagogues were burning. 
everybody was up and everybody knew what happened to Bondi. On November 9th and 10th, 1938, the Nazis launched a series of attacks against Jews in Germany and Austria. During Kristallnacht, or the Night of Broken Glass, more than 7,000 Jewish homes, businesses, and synagogues were burned and destroyed. Nearly 100 Jews were murdered that night, and about 30,000 Jewish men were taken to concentration camps, including Dachau, Sachsenhausen, and Buchenwald. The event marked a turning point in the persecution and attempted annihilation of the Jewish people at the hands of the Nazis. We felt Germans. We felt we belong here. Marga was born and raised in a Jewish family in Berlin. Her father, mother, and brother were all murdered in the gas chambers. Margot's story is just one of millions who endured the horrors of the Holocaust. It's so powerful to hear survivors share their memories. Following Crystal Mock, Jews realized that it was no longer safe for them in their home countries, and many tried to flee to Western European countries or America. A few months later, in March of 1939, the Nazi Germans began to invade and conquer bordering countries like Austria, Czechoslovakia, and Poland. All of the people living there were forced to support Hitler. In 1940, the ghettos were set up to isolate the Jews in German-occupied lands from the rest of the non-Jewish society. Jews had to wear a yellow badge shaped as a star, which identified them easily as Jews. The most populated ghetto was Warsaw. 400,000 Jews were crammed in an area that was just over a mile section. Living conditions were horrible, and many died of starvation or disease. The Nazis forced hundreds of thousands of Jews out of their homes and into smaller, poorer neighborhoods called ghettos. They had to pack their lives quickly and were forced to relocate with very little. Disease and starvation was rampant throughout the ghettos. Here is an example of original footage from the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. In March 1941, the Germans ordered the establishment of a ghetto in Krakow, Poland. In this footage, Polish Jews are forced to move into Krakow ghetto. They wear the required armbands used to distinguish the Jewish population from the rest of the city's residents. By late 1941, there were some 18,000 Jews imprisoned in the Krakow ghetto. Ghettos were just a holding place because Hitler's final solution to the Jewish problem called for the extermination of all Jews. Starting in 1941, millions of Jews were transported from the ghettos by train to be killed or put to work at concentration camps. The Holocaust is a human story, a story relevant to us all because it raises deep question of morality and human behavior that we continue to deal with. Let's take a moment and look at this photo. What do you see? Who do you see? What do you think is happening? You are going to hear many stories of victims, perpetrators, and bystanders of the Holocaust. Let's take a look at this photo that includes all three it was taken in Baden, Germany on October 1938, and it shows the perpetrators, or the Nazi police, who are marching victims to the railroad stations for deportation to ghettos or concentration camps. And watching on, as if it's a parade, are the bystanders. As we study the Holocaust, we most commonly hear tragic stories that exemplify horrific acts that Nazis did to others. Those are stories about the perpetrators. It is easy to think of the perpetrators as monsters, but it is important to remember that they too were human beings making choices. It was those choices that led to the Holocaust. What made the perpetrators behave as they did? There were many factors, centuries of anti-Semitism, aggressive propaganda, and totalitarianism government 
that turned racism into laws. Regardless, perpetrators chose to ignore their own humanity and become part of the system of dehumanization and murder. This photo shows Nazi guards in their free time just outside the Bergen-Belsen concentration camp. These smiling people are the same who also chose to torture and kill prisoners. Today, we are going to be honoring many victims of the Holocaust. In the midst of their horrifying reality, they did not have many choices, but many victims did choose to maintain their sense of identity, values, and dignity. They chose to be more than a number and to continue to put one foot in front of the other. In situations where many would give up, they chose to go on. We're going to watch a short interview with Lily Ebert, who was sent to Auschwitz at the age of 20. Lily shares her story alongside her great-grandson, Dov Foreman. Luckily, I have a few pictures from my home, from my childhood. That is the last photo before we were taken to the camp. I was born in Hungary in a middle class family. I had a very nice childhood. I had the best parents, what anybody could only dream of. That my family, or well, not only my family, all the Jewish, they wanted simply to kill. To try you now to explain with words, it is nearly impossible. Because who, I, who doesn't went through it, nobody would even understand what we went through. I survived with my two sisters. They would also not say a word about it, not because they don't want it, because they could not. Because people who don't know went through even don't know how difficult it is when people, because when you talk about something, if you really want to talk about it, then in a way you, you relive it. And nobody, nobody, wanted to really relieve this situation. What it happened, it happened. Today, nobody can change that. But people should, should remember and learn from it. Today is Holocaust Memorial. I remember my mother, my brother, my younger sister, who was killed in Holocaust. I remember the first time I went to, to my great grandmother and I said, let's set up a TikTok account. And she laughed. She'd obviously, obviously seen it on the news, people going viral for dancing. And she said to me, I'll set up a TikTok account, but I'm not dancing. <laughs> and we don't dance. We, we spread important messages and we, we continue to educate. And I think it's really important. And the response we've had is so overwhelming. It's millions of positive comments and likes every single day and for my great grandmother to know that people are recognizing her and hearing her voice it's really important for her because she knows that these are the last moments for people to hear from her and from her fellow survivors it is very important the new generation because that is the future and they should really be, be taught and they should tell the whole world what really can happen when people are not tolerant to each other. What an incredible woman, Lily Ebert. She shared that so many survivors didn't originally tell their stories because they would have to relive it. Lily, along with countless others, have shared their stories for future generations to learn from it. Now Lily and her grandson do have a TikTok account that helps them to educate people about the Holocaust. You can find them at Lily Ebert and Dov Foreman with a at or handle Lily, L-I-L-Y, 
E B E R T. And we're going to focus on the light within the darkness, on the compassion that many people did show one another. We hope it will inspire you to think how you can be an individual who bravely steps up to help rather than stands by to watch or ignore. Many survivors did not speak about what happened to them for decades. It was a traumatizing event that they were unable to share until enough time and distance had passed. However, that has changed in the last decades. As they began to see anti-Semitism reappearing around the world, even people who try claiming that the Holocaust never happened, survivors realized they had to speak up. Survivors asked, who will remember? Who will tell? How can we honor all of those who were murdered and have no one to speak for them? Having a Holocaust Remembrance Day like this one is one way to learn and to honor them. Since then, many survivors have told their stories and many organizations have been created to achieve and honor their stories. January 27th was chosen as International Holocaust Remembrance Day by the United Nations to mark the date in 1945 that the Allied forces liberated the largest Nazi concentration camp, Auschwitz, in Poland. Thank you for joining Ike Education today and participating in our International Holocaust Remembrance Day event.